This event today is made possible by Produce Business Magazine and a collaboration with the Eastern Produce Council. Everything you're going to see over the next few days, if you're joining us for the whole event, is possible because of that collaboration, combining the extraordinary local strength of the Eastern Produce Council as an, event, as an organization that represents the industry in this region, uh, with the global reach of Produce Business Magazine. We're really excited about today. We started this program last year because we identified a gap in the market, which was basically that there was no program that was really available for people who were getting their start in produce. Um, whether they're young people just coming into the industry or whether they're, um, they have mature careers in areas like food safety and marketing and are just getting into produce, there was no real program that was designed to serve them. And we sat down with our friends at Cornell University uh, on a trip up to Ithaca where I've been fortunate to have a chance to speak for many years and myself, my wife, my business partner, many of us attended Cornell, and we had a great opportunity to try and brainstorm uh, the program that you're going to see today. Um, I sometimes uh, am uh, simply overwhelmed by the uh, intellect that we've been able to gather together today, both some key industry people and the Cornell faculty, um, to provide a level of insight that I think you'll find really, really um, extraordinarily helpful in building your careers, in helping your company, and in helping the industry to grow. Whoa. Um, just to give you a little background, let's see if I can get this to work. Ah, just to give you, whoa, it's not right. Ah, okay. Uh, give you a little background on myself and how I came to be here today. Uh, that is my great-grandfather, Jacob Prevor. Uh, Jacob um, emigrated at the turn of the century to New York, and he opened up a facility in the old Wallabout Produce Market, which is where what we now call the Brooklyn Navy Yard is located. Um, my family had been wholesalers outside of Kiev, in um, what was then Russia uh, for many, many generations. And he came down and our facility is actually the last one, I'm told, in, in the back corner there. Um, and the Wildbound Market in Brooklyn was at the time the second largest produce market in the United States, uh, bigger than markets in Chicago and uh, other cities, Boston, Philadelphia. Um, but ultimately, my grandfather, Harry Prevor, moved the business to the Washington Street Market in New York. That's located down where sort of the World Trade Center site was. Um, at that time, most vegetables were sold by wholesalers, and most fruit was sold at the auction, which was held at the terminus of the rail terminals around the country. And my grandfather both had a... Um, a wholesale facility, and was a leading auction buyer. And he was, in fact, uh, for many, many decades, the chairman of the Auction Association, which ultimately wound up merging into what is now uh, United Fresh. Um, my father moved the business in 1967. Uh, the city had decided many years before that the Manhattan was too crowded and uh, things of this sort, and it wanted to move the produce market out to the Bronx. Uh, and in 1967, they opened the Hunts Point market. And we were original tenants on that market. And I know we have here in the audience uh, several firms. I, I saw Dorigo is here, Katzman, uh, maybe some others that are located on that market to this day. Um, it's the largest produce market in the world. Uh, there are some other produce markets that, um, uh, such as Rangy in Paris, that 
claim to be larger, but that's because they handle a lot of non-produce items. But this is the largest produce market in the world. Uh, there is no place else in the uh, United States that can so well help growers and shippers move their product, can so usefully introduce new products. So it's really a, a unique thing, although there are other produce markets, of course, in Boston, Philly, and so forth. There's nothing quite like Hunts Point here in the United States. Um, my family did many other things than wholesale. We became the largest independent exporter of fruits and vegetables from the United States, uh, one of the top five importers from places like Chile and, and the Caribbean. Um, when business began shifting and retailers began buying direct rather than from the wholesale markets, we opened uh, some supermarkets in both New Jersey and in Puerto Rico. Um, we opened a chain of convenience stores in Puerto Rico. We had a mail order operation before Harry and David ever thought of such a thing. Uh, we had a chain of restaurants. And as often happens, business is sort of serendipitous. Uh, we became quite substantial farmers, uh, but mostly involuntarily when we advanced money to growers in the Caribbean and they didn't pay us back. And then we wound up owning their farms and began growing uh, melons and things like that all over uh, Central America and the Caribbean. Um, my uh, father, when we had our supermarkets in New Jersey, uh, thought there was an opportunity and he bought a chain of shoppers, uh, sort of penny savers in New Jersey, which was our um, entry, you could say, into publishing in my family. Um, and my father, uh, being a frugal guy, uh, liked the idea of having free models. And uh, that's my brother on the left and me on the right in a cherry pie promotion for uh, a restaurant chain called Jan's. Um, had my father chosen to pay me, I might have pursued my brilliant career as a model. Uh, but having uh, decided to just have me work for free, my, I didn't have the motivation. Um, but I must have gotten the bug for printing because in 1985, um, so we're 31 years from ago, I uh, launched Produce Business Magazine at the PMA convention in San Francisco. Uh, it was a, a small magazine. We started with a $500 investment. Uh, I had to knock doors all over the Hunts Point market and other places trying to persuade people not only to advertise, um, but to pay in advance so we would have enough money to pay the printer for the first issue. And uh, I uh, can say that Steve DiRigo was one of the people who wrote me a check and helped me launch the, uh, the, the business back then. Um, but we've gone on to other things. Uh, we wound up doing magazines in related fields like deli business and cheese connoisseur, floral business. Uh, we do research, we do cookbooks, all kinds of things like that. Um, and then after 20 plus years of working very hard, uh, we kind of became an overnight sensation when in 2006 we launched uh, The Perishable Pundit uh, the Perishable Pundit was a very um, interesting thing. We launched it, and very quickly thereafter, um, there was a big crisis in the industry, the spinach crisis, in which spinach was basically banned. Uh, and it led to hundreds of appearances on CNN, Fox, being quoted in every newspaper in uh, England, Australia, and around the world, uh, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and so forth. And uh, so suddenly we became, in, at least in this world, sort of famous. And we went on from there to launch other things, perishablenews.com, which is a news feed not only for produce, but in different channels, floral, meat, all perishables. Um, we went on and launched this event in conjunction with the Eastern Produce Council. This is now our seventh year. Uh, and I just had some news, literally, as I was walking in the door, I got the report from last night at midnight that our total registrations for this year um, have exceeded 
our registrations from last year, and we haven't even had the show yet, and we have a lot of on-site registrants. So this will definitely be a record uh, event. Uh, the Eastern Produce Council and Produce Business sat down with the goal of bringing a resource to this industry that uh, it had never had, and bringing a resource to this part of the country that never existed, and you'll be the judge of whether we've done a good job of that today. But each year we've expanded the program. Tomorrow, for those who are gonna be here, we have our Global Trade Symposium. Uh, Wednesday is the main show day, including our Thought Leaders panel. Um, tomorrow night is the opening cocktail reception. On Thursday, we have a fantastic program for food service, for any of you who are involved at the Food Service Forum. And we also have a series of regional tours, Manhattan retailing, New Jersey retailing, the Hunts Point market, going down to the Philly market, and um, urban agriculture, which has become a new um, and important trend in the industry. Um, we do a series of executive share groups in which we have the best wholesalers, best retailers, fresh cut processors, distributors, from every market around America, gathered together and we try and guide them and provide insight by sharing best practices and bringing in new ideas. Oops, sorry. Um, good. Uh, we took this concept that was so successful here in New York and we spun it off to London where um, we have now the largest trade show and conference, the largest produce event in what is the fifth largest economy in the world in the UK. Um, and uh, we're doing the same types of ideas of sharing great ideas, sharing intellect, sharing networking opportunities and commercial opportunities in London. And that takes place every June. Uh, we spun off a publication, Produce Business UK, which is digital with a few print editions a, a year uh, to share the same kind of knowledge we do with produce business here in the US. Um, we also do an event which we're gonna be bringing here to US which is the Fresh Careers Fair, a way of getting people who want to hire people to work in the fresh produce industry with students and others who are looking for job opportunities. And that's been a big success in London and we'll be bringing it to the East Coast soon. Um, we also just returned in November. We had launched a, another spin-off event, the Amsterdam Produce Show and Conference. And every one of these events, although built on the same core ideas, help further our idea of international collaboration. And we have some of the great people who we met in Amsterdam in this room today. And this is to encourage the kind of global understanding. Uh, a lot of times I'll talk to people, say a retailer, and they say, oh, I know exactly what all the other retailers are doing. And I say, really, you know what all the other retailers are doing? And I say, yeah, I go to their stores. I say, really, which stores do you go to? And they'll give me, you know, three retailers that are down the block from them. And they think that's knowing everything about all retail, what retailers do. But by opening up our doors, bringing people around the world, bringing speakers from different places into these events, we enrich them and we enrich the audience. Uh, tomorrow, uh, rather on uh, Wednesday at the Thought Leaders panel, for example, um, Amy Lance, who has worked with Weight Rose and is on a sabbatical here in America right now, uh, will be joining on the panel very different way of approaching retail than a lot of our retailers here, and very different way of approaching supply chain relationships. Um, you know, we have more brilliant people than I here today to talk about the industry, and uh, I'm really thrilled to do that. But I did think that uh, I would try and do what I did last year, which is identify what I consider to be the top 10 transformative things going on in the industry right now. And use these as kind of backdrops that as you're going through different discussions today uh, with the incredible Cornell faculty that we have here, um, you're able to think of some of these specific challenges and specific questions and specific transformations. I, I think some of them are the same from what we saw last year, and some are new. Um, 
It's well known and often talked about that there's been a big power shift over the last few decades from sellers to buyers, and that's caused by consolidation. And Ed McLaughlin, I know from Cornell, will be talking about that today. Uh, and we're still reading about that in the news. Just yesterday, uh, your word was out that, that Albertsons was going to be trying to acquire Price Chopper in upstate New York. And I think it's fair to say that the general, um, tr the general issue that built the industry, which is these sort of family-owned regional supermarket chains, are probably not the future of the industry. Um, and for lots of reasons, both good and bad. So, some of the reason is very good that when you have a very successful concept like a Wegmans, they're able to grow now and they're able to spread out beyond that region that they worked at. But part of it is more difficult. Today, when you look at companies like Aldi, Trader Joe's, Lidl, who is about to roll out across the country, Walmart, Costco, the competition is intense, Whole Foods, many, many strong competitors, and it's increasingly difficult for that family-owned um, supermarket chain that was thinking it served everyone to really serve everyone, because there's more and more niche operations that are saying, oh no, if you want discounts, that's what you're interested in, come to us at Aldi or Lidl. You want an Epicurean experience? Oh, come to us at Trader Joe's. You're really into health and well-being? How about Whole Foods? You're, you're looking for the cheapest price per pound on quality goods? We'll come to Costco. And each one of these chains are able to do these things better, more efficiently, um, than local regional family chains. So, this consolidation is very, very real, and a real threat to producers in the United States because it means fewer customers to sell to when you're talking about national chains spreading out across the country and beating out the uh, smaller family chains. At the same time, however, there's a new shift that has been going on the last few years and is really picking up strength. Excuse me. Um, and that is a power shift back to grower shippers. And it's principally caused by a rise in genetics. Um, these are proprietary produce brands that are only available under terms that these particular producers make available. So if you like the variety of raspberry or blackberry that Driscoll's is selling, the only way you can get that is to buy them from Driscoll's. And I'll tell you, we run um, executive share groups, as I said, and we have a big retail group. And I will tell you that the people from Driscoll's um, don't ha have the love. They, they really uh, get angry, they get cut off, they do all this, but you know what? Those retailers also say the number one person they want to buy from, or the number one company, that's Driscoll's. Because they possess this proprietary variety and they've branded it, so consumers know when it's there. And that gives them enormous, enormous power. There's other models. You have people like Sunworld, who also have proprietary genetics, but what they've done is they've licensed it out to individual companies in Chile, South Africa, etc. So you can get their Scarlata seedless, excuse me, or Sable seedless, 52 weeks a year, but only by dealing with the particular people that Sunworld has allowed. You also see this in the apple business, where we have a lot of club varieties of apples. So we have, um, you know, jazz and things like this. Once again, combination of a brand with proprietary genetics. And for retailers, this becomes a real challenge because if it, as long as all they care about is having grapes, then there's lots of people to buy from. Consolidation has increased their power, all that. But if they start needing not just any grape or not just any berry, but needing Driscoll's berries, they have to think hard 
about how they're going to secure these supplies. And it's not always easy. Um, when Tesco came to America, it started its fresh and easy division out in California, Nevada, and Arizona. What did Tesco do? They held a big meeting of suppliers. They told all the suppliers, listen, you're going to sit down with us. Here's what we want. We're going to be 100% private label. You're going to ship your stuff in here, and we're going to have it repackaged. And this was their thing. And you know, one group raised their hands and said, excuse me, this is not in line with what we want to do. It's not our interest to do this. We don't want to hear any more of your plans because we're not going to participate in this, and that would be unfair. So we're going to walk out of this room right now. And that was the team from Driscoll's that did that. Um, and Tesco at the time was Driscoll's single largest customer in the UK and other places. And they put tremendous pressure on Driscoll's to bend. But they didn't have to bend, and they didn't. And that is a new produce world that didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, one other thing that I think is a, a big change in the industry is that the importance is now increasingly on the supply chain rather than just the product. Some of this is because people need more integrated supply chains because of requirements like food safety, sustainability, and traceability. So the best product in the world that's just sitting there, it doesn't answer those questions. Well, where did it come from? Can I be certain if I buy this product, I'm not going to have a write-up in the uh, newspaper or on TV saying that I'm abusing workers in, in Mexico? Um, can I be certain that I'll be able to answer government requirements if we have a recall and I have to trace this back? So product itself has simply become less important. Um, you need to be able to combine that with all these other parts of the supply chain in order to be able to offer buyers a real package that they'll find valuable. On national, not regional retailing, it's a big change. Uh, if you went back even 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and you asked, uh, and Ed McLaughlin actually has an excellent slide on this that he'll probably share with you, and you went to him and said, Are there, who's the biggest national supermarket chain, he would say, no, nobody, there's no such thing in America. Very different from, say, the UK or the Netherlands, where, of course, they're smaller countries, more concentrated markets, and they're definitely on national chains. But around 15, 10 years ago, Walmart began achieving a kind of critical mass across the country. And they were able to establish uh, the idea that there would be national chains in the country. And that changes a lot of things. It changes who's a viable supplier to these. Are you going to be just a secondary supplier, maybe to, to one depot or something? Or are you going to be a true um, supplier to the whole chain, where you're going to be able to follow their growth and gain as they grow? Um, it also speaks to a sort of um, homogenization of products in America, and some of the local movement is a reaction to this, which we'll talk about in one second. But there's clearly this move to these national chains, each one specializing, like Aldi, like Lidl, like Whole Foods, like Trader Joe's, in something, and looking to do it better than the generalists, and do it nat nationally. Uh, at the same time, that homogenization and the growth of the national trends has led to concern for uh, local procurement. And we have people here, lots of people here, who weren't coming here when we opened the show seven years ago. Uh, Heather Shavey from Costco, for example, she, she was telling me an important goal to us now is to find local suppliers, regional suppliers. Now, these have to be big regional suppliers because Costco doesn't need small suppliers of anything. But it's an important issue, and they started sending people here because they suddenly had to identify where are their regional people that we can buy from, that we can enrich our local assortments with. So local is big, but here's the secret to local and the thing to remember. As much as local is growing, every year a larger percentage of produce 
is imported than was imported the year before. So whatever local means, and whatever it's going to wind up meaning, it doesn't mean that the predominant supply of product is going to somehow be local. In fact, the big trend in produce assortment over the last 20 years, continuing today, is the gradual increase in the percentage of produce in America that comes from global sources. However, we now have a little twist, and this is a new concern for this year, which is a question about integration of markets. In the UK, for example, uh, you have a lot of growers. Uh, some of them are, are here. Uh, we have uh, Love Beats, for example, on the trade show floor, and Love Beats is part of the G's group in the UK. Now, G's is a big UK grower. Some people would call them like the Tanimore and Antle of the UK. Um, but they also have operations growing in Spain, and they have operations growing in Poland and other places. And their whole operation was built based on an assumption that there's a certain integration of markets. We tend to think of this in terms of um, selling. Can you sell or will there be tariffs? But sometimes more important to the operations of these people are things like can I send my tractors down to Spain to work there and in six months bring them back to the UK to have them work there for the season? And is there a tariff or difficulties in doing that? These are the kind of things in America we do with Salinas and Yuma, where uh, they'll bring whole um, fresh cut processing plants on tractor trailers down from Salinas down to Yuma. So these are all very powerful issues. Um, in America now, with um, the recent election of Donald Trump as president, the question is, and honestly nobody knows these answers in England or in the United States, is there going to be a disruption in the, um, in the cooperation, in the integration between these economies? And that means a lot more than just tariff-free access. It, it has to do with the whole integrated supply chain where people are able to sell product from Mexican farms, from American farms, able to send their people and resources down, back and forth. And to the degree this gets interrupted, it may mean very new things, and not necessarily predictable things. In the UK, for example, it is possible that if they block some of this product from Spain, that it will wind up being that lower quality British product at the end of its season will still be sold and have an extended season. And they might actually get very high prices for that product because it's scarce. So it's very difficult to know what the end result will be, but how the industry deals with these challenges, and I can say that um, both the government relations staff of the Fresh Produce Consortium in the UK at the United Fresh, Western Growers, are all working on these issues right now because this may be determinative on the kind of industry we have five or ten years from now. Um, big question. On the consumer end of things, I think there's two big changes going on. Uh, one has been going on for a long time, and that is that consumers are increasingly looking not for ingredients, in, not just for food that they can prepare themselves, but for complete meals. And you've got all these companies like the Blue Aprons of the world that are really focused on finding ways to solve this. There's a lot of indications that people don't have skills to cook like their grandparents did. They don't have time, they don't have inclinations. Um, and how the industry is going to integrate with these types of companies is, is a very serious issue. Will retailers be able to provide an answer here? Um, FMI, the Food Marketing Institute, big association for supermarkets, saw this happening 20 years ago. They decided to have a big meal solutions conference and all this, and the supermarkets were never really able to get past their own parochial issues of, what do you mean you're gonna put your lemons in my uh, fish case? Uh, I'm paying for that property. I want all the benefits 
that we might get from that. And they were unable to reorganize the stores in such a way to really serve this meal interest. And now other people are trying to find ways to do that. Uh, the other big issue is really the question of online and what it means for the marketing of the industry. Um, all over the world now, Amazon has taken a big uh, growth leap. Uh, after a decade of really just experimenting in its hometown, uh, it seems to finally feel it's got the magic. And um, not only in the US, but in uh, the UK and other places, they are going and expanding this, um, this concept of online ordering and delivering. Uh, on our panel on Wednesday, uh, we have Eric Stone, uh, who heads up Produce for Fresh Direct here in, in New York and in Philadelphia, um, all talking about this issue. There was just an article in the uh, Wall Street Journal and New York Times because in Manhattan, something unusual happened. All of a sudden, the cost of retail space in Manhattan is starting to drop which has never happened. It's really an extraordinary thing. I mean, it's happened only in deep recessions and a very temporary time. But what's happening, not so much with food, with non-food, is that there is all of a sudden an opportunity in which people are finding they can buy more online. You have generational shifts to younger consumers who are used to, from the time they were kids, ordering everything online. Uh, I have a 15-year-old and a 13-year-old, uh, and if their mother suggests going to the store, they moan, and they show her, look, you can order it right here at Amazon, and have it bring it to the house, and if you need me to, I'll try it on here, and then you can send it back. Um, they, they are not um, inclined to shop in the way that previous generations felt necessary. Um, we don't know the exact way this will play out in food and particularly produce. On the one hand, at one point, there was a strong conviction that consumers would not want to buy things like produce online. Um, they wanted to squeeze that melon and they wanted to uh, look at the pineapple, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of research done subsequently has indicated that's not really true. In fact, it's sort of the opposite because it turns out Consumers may look at that pineapple, but they don't actually know anything to derive from looking at that pineapple. They don't actually know how to tell if the pineapple is ripe and ready to eat or the melon is ripe and ready to eat. They don't know any of those things. So if an online company is prepared to tell people, we have experts in these things, and you just have to tell us, do you want this ripe and ready for tonight, or do you want it for this weekend, and we'll pick it out for you, it actually seems that many consumers are inclined to allow these services to make those choices for them because they do not feel competent in making these choices by themselves. Um, in any case, it's difficult to know how it will all transpire, but there's no question that there is a big future here. And it doesn't have to be that big to change the world. That's the thing to remember. Supermarkets today do not usually go out of business because a new supermarket chain came in and opens a brand new store right across the street just like your supermarket, just newer, bigger, and better. They go out of business because of a death of a thousand cuts. It's a Trader Joe's opens down the block and some people just love its puttanesca sauce and they lose 3% of their business. Costco opens down the way and they lose 2% of the business. A Whole Foods opens up nearby and they lose a couple of percentage of business. L Lidl or Aldi open up, a save a lot, deep discounters, they pick up three or 4% of the business. A, a Walmart Supercenter, opens up out of town a little bit. They lose another couple of percentage of business. And a Fresh Direct or an Amazon Fresh rolls into town with a highly sophisticated 
online purchasing program, and they lose 3%. But if you have a supermarket and sales drop 20%, because they have eight different competitors who are all taking two and a half percent or so, you know what? That's enough to drive out of business lots and lots of supermarkets all over the country. So these changes of national supermarkets, these changes of online services, of meal solutions companies taking a few percentages, they're setting up the consumer interaction with the industry in a way very different from um, what we have seen before. So those are my 10 ideas that I hope you'll keep sort of in the back of your mind as you're going through the uh, workshops and things today uh, and try and apply some of the things you're hearing to an industry that's been being influenced by things such as this. And I, I think you'll find it helpful and how you want to position your own career, how you want to position your company, and how you believe the industry can best grow. And uh, I really look forward to, um, to seeing you throughout the day, and part of what you get from this event is um, the uh, unlimited access afterwards. So always feel free, go to perishablepundit.com, find my email, send me a note, call me, uh, I'm really glad you were able to come, and we're really going to try hard to help you a bit today. Thank you very much.